Councillor Sherlock is also joining us tonight. So uh, a special welcome to him and a thank you to him as well, as he's always very supportive for Mossman Council's environmental programs. Um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the Darug people as the traditional custodians of the land from where I am today. And would also like to extend that acknowledgement to the Borragagal and Camaragal people of the Gaimaragal clan of the Aurora Nation from the Mossman LGA. As you know, we're here tonight with Joe Taranto from Good for the Hood to discuss reducing emissions on the home front. Um, and Ursula Hogben is also here to talk to you about some of the great resources they have from Zero Emission Sydney North. And after Ruth, uh, uh, sorry, Ursula, uh, we'll talk for about five minutes about that. And then Ruth, Dr. Ruth Irwin from Mossman Council will also talk to you a bit more about the resources that Mossman Council can offer on the reducing emissions front. So thank you again and over to Jo. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Luani. Um, and thank you for the warm welcome. I am um, Jo Taranto. Uh, I am from Good for the Hood. And uh, it is my great pleasure to be with you this evening. I come to you from the land of the Wollamogal um, people who are here on Eora, I'm here on Eora and um, Darug Nations right on the edge in North Ryde this evening. And obviously, like you, I'm in lockdown. And um, as much as I know it's been pretty horrible for so many, um, I'm really grateful that you can spend some time with us this evening. Uh, I have been working with Good for the Hood uh, as one of the co-founders and now managing director for the last four years. Um, and I started this venture as a citizen of my community who was concerned um, about the world, the planet, my local backyard, the parks my kids played in, and the future of um, the, the safe future of my children, really. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of you are on this call tonight who have that similar story. You get involved because you care. Um, and you deeply care about people and places. So that's really what Good for the Hood is about. It's about local solutions, about facilitating and getting people involved um, and doing it in a way that's inclusive and positive. Uh, we strongly believe that for us to solve some of these huge global challenges, we need inclusive, um, positive, exciting, innovative solutions, uh, which everyone can be part of. We need the mainstream to drive change. So that's where we feel we can play a small part. So tonight is all about doing what you can do with where you are right now. I don't care if you have a lot of money or no money. I don't care if you have a lot of friends or no friends. I don't care if you work in finance or you're unemployed. There is something you can do with what you have right now. And my call to action is to do something from this evening. If you're already doing a lot, amazing but there are things that we can do speak to one more family reach out to one more friend bring someone else on board give someone a pat on the back for doing something great this is about bringing us together to create positive community action i'm really passionate about messaging and messaging this well not making this a battle or a criticism or a fight <laughs> Um, really making our community stronger with the solutions that we can tap into with emissions reduction. You have so much power to influence your community and you can do it in a positive and inclusive and encouraging way. And so that is what I would like you to think about this evening. And so many of you I know are already doing this. Um, the messaging is so critical. People tune out when we talk about climate change, when it becomes too dark, or too divisive. We need to bring it back to a place of positive, exciting, creative solutions, which are actually going to change our lives for the better, not be something we have to give up or lose. So our opportunity tonight is to really talk about what it means when we talk about emissions, and then what are we going to do about it as a community? 
We aren't the government, we aren't the policy makers. So do we have a role in this? And absolutely, we're talking about the role of everyday citizens in creating change and for taking up a challenge within our own homes and within our own communities. Um, I am not a climate scientist, I'm not a politician, and I'm certainly not an engineer or an architect or an, you know, electrical, uh, electrically minded in any way. I am just a citizen like you who has embarked on their own journey, who's recognised that there are similarities between my journey and so many other people in Australian communities, and I've tried to make it simple. So the challenge is there, and we really have such an opportunity to take it up. A couple of, like last year, and, and as the Fight for Planet A was launched, we were really lucky to work with ABC and develop some toolkits and resources to help communities embark on this journey. And certainly what we've seen is just like when War and Waste was on TV, there is such an excitement in communities to embrace low and zero emissions technology and solutions. And they're not particularly difficult to get involved with. So we're excited, we hope you are excited, and we really want you to walk away feeling empowered I go to so many talks and things and walk away in tears. And I know that you probably feel that too sometimes when we talk about the enormity and the risk of the challenges that we face in our communities. But I don't want that to be where we are tonight because you would not be here if you did not recognise that we need to reduce our emissions. So I want this to be a positive experience that lifts you up and keeps you going. We all know that the challenge with greenhouse gases and indeed climate change is that we're dealing with an invisible enemy. We are dealing with the greenhouse gas emissions which we can't see and we're creating them and we don't always know when we are. It's very easy therefore, a bit like COVID, to buy into stories and reasons why we shouldn't do things because it's this big nebulous thing and who are we to believe and who are we to trust and what are we to do and it's not my problem. There is undoubtable, uh, you know, scientific evidence that we are in an existential crisis and we are up against an invisible en uh, enemy, but the solutions are so easy and so at our fingertips. Uh, certainly when we talk about greenhouse gases and we look at the uh, treaty that we've signed as a nation, we're talking about a group of gases which humans are creating, which are going into our atmosphere and that are causing our uh, climate to change significantly over time. The problem with a, a change that's protracted, and we've known about this for a long time, is that we've been slowly plodding along with not a lot of change at speed. We saw in our response to the COVID crisis that when we need to respond quickly, we can. So as communities, we've made a lot of changes over time, but what we really need is mass momentum, mass mainstreaming of the, and mass adoption of the things we're talking about tonight. And that's where you can play a role. Now, when I present this talk, I generally hear four things. And these are the arguments or the challenges or the questions that come up. So I just thought, let's get them out in the open first. First of all, there's inevitably someone that says, but Australia is not a problem. And I would say to you, of course, Australia is not the problem, but we are certainly a player in this. When we talk about Australians, we have a per capita problem. We know that per, by per capita, Australia's are some of the biggest emitters in the world. We live really well here. We consume a lot. And we are in a position where our per capita emissions are the 12th highest in the world. Now that's batting way above our average when it comes to population. And certainly as one of the richer nations in the world, we also have, I would, well, I would argue, a, an ethical duty to tackle these issues because we can. 
What a fortunate and privileged position we are in. We also hear this challenge of that what I do at home really doesn't matter because we've got such huge polluters in the world and we've got, you know, a federal government that's not doing enough. Or we've got all these other things which really mean that, you know, what I do in my own home is not actually going to make a difference. And I agree. At the end of the day, if you do nothing right now, maybe it won't make a huge difference in the overall uh, picture. But what if every Australian said that? What sort of position are we going to be in? We know that household consumption globally contributes to something like 72% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a pretty essential component. It may not be the biggest player in Australia's emissions, but it's certainly part of the picture. And I'd also argue that if we say it's not our job, that lets other people say it's not their job. So don't let people off the hook. If we want other people to take ownership of their emissions, we also have to take ownership of our own. Often hear people say, oh, well, we can't do this yet because we don't have the, you know, the emissions technology that we need to really harness and embrace that we do. Stop waiting for this magical one that's going to come. It is here. We have all of the things we need right now to transition our homes to low or low and no zero, uh, zero emissions technology. It is very simple. It is not hugely complex and we're not waiting for this magical thing to arrive. Sure, there are things that are going to make our life easier. Certainly when the price of electric vehicles comes down a little bit more, when we have battery technology that we can put into our homes that it's going to be worthwhile that uh, the cost outlay, we'll be in a position where they'll be a little bit easier. But we can still do an awful lot now. So stop waiting for the big thing. And the other one I hear a lot from people who are really passionate about this issue is that our population is just too big. It is unsustainable for us to have this many people on earth. We've just got to have less kids or we've got to implement some kind of global population control. I'm just going to let that sit with you for a bit because I often hear that and I think logically I get it, but we need to think about what we're actually saying then. And we also need to recognise that pragmatically, even if we could reduce the people on earth, we actually wouldn't fix the problems right now because we already know there's too many emissions in our atmosphere and we actually have to draw those down as we are right now. The other problem with that is that how feasible is that, do you think, in Australia, given that we live in a, you know, a fairly free society? You've seen how people have reacted when we've talked about lockdowns. Um, is that really going to be something that the mass population is going to buy into? And thirdly, what we know about the world is that when standards of living increase for people, population stabilises as well. So we should be really focusing on improving the standard of living of globally of people and not focusing on picking apart developing nations. And lastly... It is not developing nations who are living beyond their means. It's us. We are the ones who are over-consuming. We are batting so far above our average in Australia that it's on us. This is not a size of population issue. This is everything to do with how we live. And the number of people in the world is not going to change our emissions if we still rely on fossil fuels for our energy production. So by changing our energy um, use and creating a cheaper, more accessible energy form that other uh, countries can uh, access, by that nature, we may well be improving their quality of life anyway and drawing down population issues. So I'm hoping if any of those uh, have been playing in the back of your mind ever that you can start to think about uh, the role that those issues actually play. I will also say that you are not the problem. This is not about picking on people and putting it on the citizens of Australia, but you absolutely are part of the solution. We know that 
you know, there are 20 fossil fuel companies around the world who, you know, mine our oil and gas and coal reserves. And we know that they're linked to about a third of the global gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But it's a dance. We need the government to respond and react to us. We need corporations to lead and react to what their consumers and what the industries are asking for. So please don't give up your participation in this by saying it's someone else's problem. We have so much we can do. And if we've done what we can and it's still not changing, that's a different story. So when you look at our emissions contribution by sector in Australia, we certainly know that the biggest opportunity, and you'll hear it all the time, is electricity. We have so much we can do by transitioning to renewable energy. It's as simple as that. If you don't know that, I'm sure you're well across it and know more about it than I do, but certainly we have so much opportunity and Australia is so privileged because we're in this amazing sun-drenched country. Um, and my dog has just joined me from outside the garage door. I'm hoping my partner will go and rescue her in a second. Otherwise, she'll just pour us in with me for a little while. So I'm going to um, invite you, if you are a person who needs a metric, who wants to, say, set themselves a target, who at the beginning of every January gets on the scales and looks it down and thinks, right, there's my, there's my figure that I've started. I need somewhere to go to. Um, you can't measure, you know, you can't fix what you can't measure. So it's really important if you want, if you're someone who needs a footprint or you need to map out your emissions and you really want to know what that looks like, there are so many tools out there where you can calculate your individual, your family's footprint. Are they perfect? No. Are they complicated? Some are yes. <laughs> um, are there multiple solutions out there? Of course. My argument would be is find one and use that as your benchmark. There's a lot of great tools out there. And why they're helpful is that they allow you to really track how you're going. Now, we know when an organisation embarks on emissions reduction, they have to set targets for reduction. Under the um, Paris Agreement, people have to commit um, year by year reductions. Why not do that as a household? Make it your annual review, give a bit of an audit, and check back in with the family and let them know how they're going. Um, it really is hard to know what we're looking at unless we have something to work off. And whether that's uh, whether you need that number or you just need a score or whatever that is, um, it can be really helpful to map your uh, footprint. Now, I think it's also helpful when we're do doing any changes within the home to look at a hierarchy of how we want to uh, avoid our emissions or reduce our emissions. So just like a waste, waste hierarchy where we talk about, um, you know, reuse and recycling and avoiding, it's really important to know that for us to have maximum impact, the first thing we can do when we're looking at reduction is to try and avoid those emissions being created in the first place. Then embark on a journey with renewables. There's really no other way. <laughs> One way or another, we have to be getting our energy from renewables. So that will be on your to-do list. And then once you've avoided and switched to renewables, try and reduce. And you will get to a point where you will be able to knock off a large percentage of your emissions if you do those first three. But no Australian family is going to be zero emissions. Um, well, most of them won't be able to without at least some offsets as well. So if you are really passionate about this and you want to start offsetting some of those unavoidable emissions, then you're also in a position to do that. But for organisations, this is the journey they have to go on to get net zero. This is the journey we have to go on as a state and a nation. Avoid it, switch to renewables, reduce our um, emissions where we can, and then ultimately offset. And we're not just offsetting our current emissions, we are drawing back as well so that we can get to a level um, of reduction year on year that will get us to our targets. And we know that we need to be net zero by 2030. And we are just talking before about 
the amazing Leslie Hughes. Um, if you haven't seen some of her talks, um, definitely check it out. We have the call to action. We have the science. This is about the doing now. Um, and as Craig Rucastle says, do our best and remove the rest. So I want you to have a quick think about your own personal and family and maybe even work emissions. Um, might be a little lower at the moment. Um, but if you want to just chuck them in the chat, um, but the, all the areas where you know there are emissions being created um, and anything, you might have already embarked on some of those reductions, but where do you know your family is creating emissions just by living in Australia right now? Um, just going to, while I'm doing that, while I'm waiting for your amazing responses, I'm going to add um, Ursula as a co-host. Sorry. So she can share her screen in a sec. Um, yeah, so using fossil fuels, absolutely. Great. Oh, yep, Tom has mentioned Leslie Hughes. Um, we might be able to find a recording of that, um, Tom, as well. I know that uh, she recently did a talk with the um, Australian Parents for um, Climate Action. Ursula's got it. I knew she would. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and Ruth, I'll add you as a co-host too, um, just in case you have anything you want to do. Beautiful. All right. So we've got um, people using fossil fuels. Anyone else can think of any other areas in their life where they know they're creating emissions? While you're doing that, I'm going to get us to talk a little bit about change. So when we're looking at reducing our emissions, we need to think about the cost of what we're doing. Now, there are some things out there you can do which are really high cost. You could replace every uh, appliance in your house with the most efficient appliance you could get. Uh, you could put in battery um, power. You might already have a battery. Uh, most people are kind of waiting for that magical moment where the 10-year payoff is, uh, <laughs> is still under warranty. That we get that. Yep. yep, heating and cooling, brilliant. Um, I also advocate really strongly, particularly in some of the communities we work with, that there are heaps of no-cost options. There are things you can do that will cost you nothing. Um, so we don't need to always invest with the, you know, expensive options. Some people like having the more exciting technological solutions, and there are some pretty exciting ones. Um, but we also need to think about those changes which are just set and forget. What is something I can do once and don't have to think about again? Because I don't know about you, I've got a lot going on in my brain and I cannot guarantee that I am going to remember every day to nag my children to get out of the shower at the right time, um, that I'm going to always remember to turn off my car when I get to the kiss and ride. All of those things, um, which are habitual changes, I need to remember to do them. If there are things that you can do which are one-off changes and you do not have to uh, worry about them, they're, they're obviously the preference. Now, that is why switching to renewables is awesome because once it's done, it's done. If you accidentally forget to take a shorter shower or to, you know, make sure you've got enough food in the fridge or, you know, turn the lights off, it's okay. You're still using renewable energy. Um, I always like to think about targeting the things which are highest impact. And sometimes that means you need to know what's the highest impact. Again, that's why a calculator or a footprint um, is useful. And I'll also talk about a couple of other tips and tools which can make life a little easier in terms of knowing about impact. Also, how likely are you to do these things? You know, it's always great to think about how aspirational we are. Um, but if you're not going to do it, it's not actually going to be a long standing change. And then I always like to think about what's feasible and what has momentum in our communities. And I, I definitely know that um, the work that's been happening in the Mossman community and around the North Shore with um, Zero Emission Sydney North has helped momentum. So we've got to think about not just what we're doing in our houses, but what our neighbours are seeing us do and the changes that we can help them create in a really positive and completely unjudgmental way. I also really love 
looking at social science and the changes that happen in communities. And I love this concept of norming and recognising that actually suddenly solar panels on our roofs are very normal in Australian suburbs. In fact, I've seen in the eight years in my street, a street with no solar panels to a street that has a majority of solar panels. And I don't live in a community that I would consider particularly passionate about climate action. But we've seen this impact of when you get solar panels, that your neighbours are statistically more likely to get them. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and there's a, definitely a power of being visible with your changes. So I would always advocate if there is a way that you can make your changes visible to your community, again, in a way that is um, encouraging and attractive and exciting and positive, that is so powerful. Um, it happened with the Hills Hoist. Communities all over Australia became so aspirational about having a Hills Hoist clothesline in their backyards. Women would, particularly at that point in time, would peer over the fence and aspire to have this amazing thing in their lives that was going to make their life easier and the quality of their family's lives easier. That's what solar panels can do. In my opinion, solar panels are the hills hoist of 2021. This may not apply to you. You may not be someone who's particularly concerned about money at the moment. But when I say to communities who don't have the sort of money to invest in solutions that they may need to, that you can use uh, the reductions you make in energy bills uh, to help you save, to invest in things if you need to. You can use it as your own sustainability reserve. Probably Mossman Council and a lot of other councils do this. They have a pot of money, they invest in something, they have a payback period, and then they invest back into something else. There's no reason why we can't set up our own little sustainability funds within our families. If finances are tight, this can help you save. It's like a forced saving plan. <laughs> um, but if money's not a motivator, this is where we see challenges with communities. An uptake of solar in the Muslim community, for example, has not been as high as some others. So what is it that's going to drive people to adopt things like solar when it's not money? and not savings on electricity bills? That is a question for you that is rhetorical. <laughs> I'm not sure the answer. Um, fantastic, bring back the hills hoist, <laughs> yes. Um, awesome, Oshel has pointed out, um, moving our su uh, super from fossil fuel supporting funds, absolutely. So inadvertently, our money is helping fund <laughs> so many things in our communities which are huge polluters, um, absolutely. Um, okay. Before we get into some of the actions in a little bit more detail, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the diffusion of innovation model. And this is from Rogers. This is from 1960, 62 maybe. Um, he talked about um, how technology and adoption of innovation moves through communities and why people, why people get involved. So this happens when a new iPhone comes out. Um, it happens when there's a new service. Um, we've seen it in agriculture and healthcare. Why do we adopt new things? Why do we change in certain ways? Um, and more importantly, who gets on board first and why? So it's really interesting. I, I, for some reason, the link for him is removed there, but it's worth checking out because it's important to understand why people get involved. And most people who are early adopters, especially when it comes to innovation and technology, and you probably are yourselves, these people, have got involved for a few reasons. And one of them is because they like to be at the front of this, like, all right, I'm, I'm going to lead the way. This is, you know, I'm a pioneer here. <laughs> um, I don't think we're obviously at the early adopter phase in Australia when it comes to solar panels. We've certainly seen huge um, uptake uh, in the last little while. But we need to understand this doesn't happen in one go. So if you're frustrated with the speed at which your community is moving, you just might not be... Um, you know, that far along in that diffusion of innovation yet. So don't lose hope. Some great um, information there about what it takes to get mainstreaming of those changes and also recognising that there will be people in your community who will resist this to the day that they die <laughs> and that is okay. 
Um, we don't need everyone on board, but we do need a lot um, as well. Um, now, I have slightly slightly different statistics to um, what you had uh, zero emission sitting off. Um, Ursula can talk to this, but this is from the same place, and it's only within a couple of percentages. So we must have picked a different period. Um, I'd, uh, I'd go with, with Ursula's work because I'm sure that's... <laughs> but this is just off the um, snapshot climate tool. So if you don't live in Mossman or if you live in a particular suburb and you just want to look at your suburb um, and, you know, and you want to compare it against another one, this is a great free publicly available tool called Snapshot Climate. And you can see where the vast majority of emissions are coming from by group in your community. Um, so when we look at Mossman, the LGA, um, so local government area, um, you can see that well over 60%, and I think um, the other stats were caught up to almost 69%, are coming from electricity. And of that, um, you know, at least 37% is coming from residences. So it's a pretty compelling opportunity um, and also um, pretty easy opportunity, really. Um, and obviously the second biggest one, and, and so the, the two that we would focus on really is transport. So transport and electricity, that's where your emissions coming from. Waste is obviously massively important. Don't uh, start stopping recycling or any of those things. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the circular economy. Please keep recycling. Please keep putting things in the right bin. Please don't litter. Um, but if you're worried about emissions and your focus is entirely on being zero waste and that is all you're doing, then you need to think a little bit more broadly about where the impact is that you can make a difference and if you can maybe do both. So we're going to talk tonight, not so much about waste, sorry, um, about energy, food and transport. Now, the reason we talk about these three things is apart from the fact that they're high impact, they're also pretty low effort, um, and they're also where the majority of your emissions within your home are coming from. Now, this obviously doesn't cover uh, divestment. If that's, um, you know, if you want to go and do that, there's some great resources um, that Ursula will talk about. Um, it doesn't include, um, you know, the other areas outside your residence, your work, maybe your business. Um, but in your home, these are the things that you can do that will help draw down your emissions. Again, when you're coming to energy, we're going to try and talk about avoidance first, switching to renewables, reducing and then offsetting. I just wanted to give you a little snapshot. Now, this is from the Resilient Sydney platform, which is a platform that councils have access to and it's run um, with state government funding as well. Um, and just a little comparison of where Mossman sits with other communities on the North Shore. Um, again, not to shame anyone, <laughs> maybe as a call to action, but certainly you're on the, uh, the spectrum of higher emitters. <laughs> um, and when you look at solar uptake as well, um, you are on the lower end of solar uptake compared to say Northern Beaches. Um, so, um, you know, I did a workshop with Willara on this and they were just, feeling very, very sheepish at this point in time. Um, but look, it's not, a, it's really not um, anything to be shocked by. You have larger homes, you know, you, you maybe have more vehicles, you know, there's certainly things that make sense um, when we look at where our emissions are coming from. Um, but that just means there's more opportunity, right? Um, so when we're looking at our residences and where our greenhouse um, emissions are coming from, we hit it on the, um, the head before, I think it was Ruth that mentioned heating and cooling. Absolutely, huge amount of emissions are coming from our air con or our heating. Uh, we've got our appliances, our hot water um, and our lighting. Now, when we ask people to, to work out where the um, emissions are coming from, a lot of people think it is lighting plays a lot bigger part um, in that. And, Obviously, with a switch to LED technology, uh, we've seen a huge reduction um, in the impact that light have played in, although we do have far more lights in our lives than we used to. Um, but so we're going to talk a little bit about high impact, low effort uh, switches that you can make. 
Um, and certainly recognising that electricity is far and above going to be the biggest contributor to emissions in your home. If you do nothing else from tonight, if you are not um, purchasing renewable energy, switching to green power, um, you know, or putting rooftop solar on, um, they would be absolutely the best thing that you can do um, if you do nothing else. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about avoidance as well. Um, and most of our electricity, about 84% from the grid, is coming from fossil fuels still in Australia. We did have an exciting moment uh, a couple of weeks ago um, when we switched that point where there was more creation um, into the grid from renewable energy than there was from fossil fuels. Um, and that was for a couple of reasons. One, it was a particularly warm day. Um, and it was also that time of year when not many people had their aircon on. But that was a milestone and one that needs to be celebrated. And I think we're starting to see much more impact of renewables in the grid. But obviously, uh, we still rely on a lot of fossil fuels for our energy. I just want to shout out for my love of measuring energy. If you don't have a power meter or a way that you can real time track what's being created in your home, I would really encourage you to invest in one. Now they can be really cheap. They can be like $20. You can get ridiculously expensive ones as well. If you've got solar panels, you've probably got an app. Um, if you don't have an app linked to your solar panels, I'd recommend it. Now this is from my energy, this is from my house today. And I dork out so hard over this because um, especially on a day like today, which is incredibly warm um, and I'm not running, you know, any heating or cooling, you know, I'm looking at, I think it was 57% energy independence just from my solar panels at about four o'clock this afternoon. It doesn't normally look like that. But what you can see is your pattern of consumption. And I think it's really critical for us to know what is pulling the power from our homes. Where are we creating emissions um, on a day to day? Because it's very hard to avoid things if you don't know. You know, is my computer sucking all that power? Is it my fridge? You know, recognizing. And so you can tell when you have a, a meter in your home what's pulling the power. As soon as it comes on within 15 minutes, if there's a lag, you can know that, oh, I turned the oven on and it's just spiked. Um, so it is really useful. You'll see when you look at my day-to-day -day usage, my hot water comes on at about 1 a.m. That's when my hot water um, heater comes on. So you start to get used to the habits of, you know, when my off-peak times are and what, you know, what is using, the, you know, what, what appliance was that? Who's got that thing on? You can become quite ridiculous about it. But it is very exciting. And what it does is enable you to feel empowered. Suddenly you can make choices, especially if you've got solar, you can start um, putting appliances on at the right times of day. You can, you know, uh, and we are going to have appliances which are going to be, um, you know, using, uh, pulling power at more convenient times. And there's so many great technologies that are coming in that way. So, um, but definitely shout out to the power meters. If you don't have one, get one. Um, there's, you can get them from Bunnings, but, um, you know, Reduction Revolution also has some great appliances as well. All right. These are the things that I would say are on your to-do list. And if you've already done them, awesome. We'll focus on something else tonight. Um, but we are going to switch, would encourage you to switch to renewables. Um, we talked about, you know, avoidance first, um, but I'm just gonna tell my partner to take my dog away. <laughs> Sorry about this, everyone. But she's gonna become very vocal. Um, there we are. Um, all right. Now, rooftop solar has suddenly become uh, so much more affordable in our communities. And there's so many ways that you can put rooftop solar on without actually spending a cent. Um, so you can uh, purchase the uh, service uh, and pay it off over a number of years. Um, and it comes out with smart consumption about even. And then after you've paid that off, you're in, you've got all the benefits for the life of the solar panels. So the days of having to save up thousands of dollars to throw solar on your roof are well gone. 
um, and definitely encourage you to check out solar quotes or talk to um, Zero Emission Sydney North about the options that are out there in your community. I would argue, uh, argue that you would need to go to a reputable solar provider who has been around a little while because we do have, unfortunately, some people who crop up and then disappear. Uh, and you do want someone who's going to guarantee the work and to, um, you know, give you that peace of mind because it is something that's going on your roof and, you know, it can cause leaks or crack or various things. Um, it's really important to understand that hot water use is a big puller. It's about 25% of our energy bills, even though it's using off-peak power generally, um, unless you've got, you know, um, and even if you've got, unless you've got solar hot water. Um, but yeah, it's really important that you recognise that shorter showers actually are really important, as boring as that sounds. Um, and turning down the thermostat on your um, hot water heater as well is really valuable. Um, and that is one of those set and forget changes. Do it once. You don't have to worry about the fact that, you know, your teenage son has the water on full ball and is just standing there burning himself. Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, and it's also safer for kids too. If you're having to turn on a lot of cold water, um, then, you know, your, your shower is actually too hot. Um, and also um, those, the shower heads, the best shower heads are probably the worst in terms of those ridiculous, you know, ones that just feel like you're in a waterfall. You do need to look at the amount of volume that's coming out of your shower head, as boring as it sounds. Um, obviously, heating and cooling is critical. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. Um, in winter, draft proofing is really critical. We get just cold enough to be annoying in Sydney. Um, if you're in Melbourne or something, then it's a different kettle of fish altogether. Um, if you've got a pool, um, you are looking at a massive sucker of uh, energy and, and creator of emissions there, unless you have um, solar heating. Um, and then ultimately, once you've done what you can, you really need to talk to your energy provider about what they're doing to offset your emissions as well. Now, I would argue that you should switch to a provider that only does renewables, um, but obviously do your, um, you know, find out what's out there. Again, talk to people who are in this space and get some advice about who you can use. Um, so I've talked a little bit about hot water. Uh, so heating in winter generally uses more electricity than cooling. Um, if you've got solar, then trying to heat or cool your house during the day is a great tactic. Um, but you need to think about the sort of heating and cooling we're using in our homes as well. Ducted cooling is a lot more um, energy intensive um, than fans. So if you've got a mechanical device for cooling, uh, that is really, really helpful through summer. And please, if you've got ceiling fans, um, use them in winter as well when you're heating the house. Um, it's you know, any time you can use that mechanical device to move some of that hot air back down, um, it can make a big difference. Um, so obviously the temperature, we know that thermostats, keeping them at 18 to 20 degrees for heating, 25 to 27, we know that every time you increase or decrease that degree on your heating or cooling, um, it can be as much as 10% increase um, in the amount of electricity used. Um, with appliances, the big five, as we like to call them, the washing machine, the dryer, if you've got one, there's two dryers on there. I'm not sure why I've got a bit ambitious there. Uh, the dishwasher, your air con, and if you've got a pool heater or pump. Um, if you've got those items and you've got solar, they have to go on during the day. Timers are your friend. Um, if you don't have them, um, you can use off-peak, obviously, if you can do it in the but after 10 o'clock or before seven, it's a bit annoying having those things go on at night though. Um, and recognising the small role, but the kind of consistent role that standby power plays in our lives too. So our homes are sitting, sucking an awful lot of power just um, when everything is seemingly off. So about 10% of our electricity bills can be from standby. So if you can look at the ways that you can get those appliances, which do go into standby mode, either off at the wall, and printers are a huge one. If you've got a printer that's sitting there, you can spend easily $100 a year just keeping that thing on standby. So if it doesn't need to be on, turn it off at the wall. 
if you go away for extended period, <laughs> sorry, as soon as I said that, I thought that's cool. When we can go away for an extended period, um, having those things turned off, um, turn off your power at the, at the box if you need to. Um, we don't need to have standby power pulling from the grid uh, when we're not there. Um, if you are turning your hot water off, um, just to have a look at what the safety precautions are when turning it back on though, because you need to flush it for a period as well. Um, obviously looking at energy efficiency of your appliances, it's not the be all and end all, but it does make a difference. You can see that it makes up um, a, a considerable amount of your energy use at home. Um, we talked about lighting. If you haven't switched to LEDs, please do. If you've still got fluoros anywhere, switch them over. You don't need to, you know, it, it's a small investment but my goodness, it pays off and they use about 80% less electricity. You'll see an immediate response. Most councils or businesses, the first thing they do when they're looking at reducing their energy use is to switch to LED lighting because it's so simple and it's a set and forget change. And once you do it, you don't have to keep getting up there and changing it like you used to with the old halogen globes. All right, so please, um, I think you're already doing it because you're all awesome. Um, yes, um, the other thing which is very critical, I haven't mentioned it, is that gas is not a renewable energy. Please don't think that gas is more sustainable, that it's emissions free. In fact, what we are advocating for in Australia is to let electrify everything, electrify, and switch to renewables. So if you have gas appliances, it's, it's time to look at how we can transition those. Um, there's so many amazing electric appliances which are going to be the future. Um, poor old Victoria um, have so much reliance on gas down there um, and it really is a huge issue for them in transitioning and doing a lot of work on it. Um, but yes, if you're looking at new appliances and you're relying on gas, we need to look at a transition out of that eventually because it is not um, a solution to our emissions woes. Thank you, Alani. <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, all right. So if you've got any great tips that I've missed, things that you think you've done and you just think it was so easy and I can't believe I didn't do it earlier, um, this is your chance to throw it in the chat. We will have a chance at the end if anyone's got anything they really want to share as well. Um, but I just obviously don't want to run over too much. Um, food, um, this is pretty simple, really, um, kind of. Um, again, we're coming back to our hierarchy. We always need to think about where our food's coming from. We know about air miles. We know that uh, when the only thing that's worse than um, consuming a lot of ruminant meats and dairy for the planet is actually food that's been flown here from somewhere else. So um, try and buy local, support local farmers, support regenerative agriculture. It's such an amazing space um, and transition. We know that agriculture um, is a huge contributor to emissions. Um, and we know that avoiding or choosing better uh, beef, lamb and dairy is also part of that. We eat a lot of it in Australia and I grew up on a beef cattle farm. So I'm not advocating that you have to give up beef. In fact, I think our farmers need more love than ever. But um, we need to support farmers who are really trying to transition to regenerative practices. We need to phase out some of the volume of, of the meat products that we're eating or choose chicken or pork more often um, because they just don't have that same methane. There are so many things they're doing in this space in terms of adjusting um, the diet of, of the livestock to try and reduce that um, emissions. Um, but there's amazing ways that you can eat more planet friendly. And um, obviously wasting food, this is where we come into our own with that waste contribution. If you can't, um, you know, avoid, if you can't avoid food waste, and I know that it happens to us all at times, um, please compost at home or find a compost um Host that you can donate your compost through. Find a neighbour who's doing it. I'm guaranteed there's someone close by that you can um, check out through the Share Waste app. Um, if there's food organics in your community um, that you can tap into or community gardens that you can put scraps into, awesome. Um, 
And then obviously curbside food organics will become much more prominent for all our communities over time. Um, it's not an easy transition and it's not a perfect one, you know, emissions transition. You've already great, got a great system in uh, Mossman, but certainly food waste from commercial premises and um, multi-unit dwellings um, plays, plays a role. Um, methane is a potent greenhouse gas and certainly um, any avoidance of that is, um, is incredibly important as well. All right. I'm sure you can share your favourite food tips or local, maybe you've got a local um, supplier or someone, a co-op or someone that, you know, is a great, you know, butcher that's doing something awesome. Um, please share your tips here. This is a great chance to, to um, give them a shout out. Um, and now transport. I probably should have done food before transport, but, you know, maybe it's dinner time and we're hungry. Um, but there's some simple things we can do with transport, and I'm sure Ursula will talk a bit more deeply about this in a second. Um, when we can fly again, uh, pre-COVID, about 1% of Australians were offsetting their flights. That's not a lot of people. <laughs> it is such a simple thing to add that $2, $1, whatever it's going to be to your ticket. Please offset your flights. We know you can't always avoid flying unless you're in a global pandemic. But if you can, when you fly again, please tick that box. Those offsets matter and they won't get purchased unless you pay for them. Um, it's really important when you are driving your car that you drive it efficiently. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but we spend an awful lot of time in Australian cars, about 20% of our time sitting idle, either in traffic or waiting, you know, to pick up someone from school or that uses an awful lot of emissions and creates a lot there. So if you can turn the engine off, um, it is World Electric Vehicle Day. So shout out to the electric vehicle owners. Um, we know that this is an amazing space. If you can adopt an electric vehicle, uh, technology, this is going to be our era for this. And my goodness, aren't they amazing? I've been in several and they are a different kettle of fish when it comes to driving. So I'm so excited about, you know, seeing electrified bus, um, you know, technology and just really adopting this fantastic, um, efficient uh, technology. Um, there's lots of resources there and I'm going to short, uh, short, I don't want to steal Ursula's thunder. Um, but lastly, like many of you who are driving a petrol um, powered vehicle or diesel, we're in a situation where we're like, I have to drive, I can't do anything else. I will try and get public transport when I can, but I have to drive. So you can do what I've done and you can offset your vehicle. Um, I purchased my Go Neutral annual subscription for $99 and I know that it has offset the average miles for a Australian family car. Um, and I know that I put my sticker on my back, a couple of people see it when I'm in traffic it's what I can do. It's the best I can do right now until I can do more. So it's a pretty simple transition. Um, and certainly electric bikes, um, you know, we're looking at all sorts of different batteries. There's so many charging stations which will pop up. There's plug share where you can go and find out what charging stations are around. This is very exciting for Australia. Um, so I'll let, I'll let Ursula say more in a second. Now, I'm at the point of introducing Ursula, I think, if she's keen. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to throw over to Ruth from Mossman Council. So Ursula, are you able? I'm already, Jo. All fine. Thank you. Awesome. So I need to enable you. All fine. Share. All done. It's all fine, yeah. Joe. It's all ready to go. Beautiful. Yep. All right. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> so, do I just stop sharing and allow you? No. Yep. I think there I'm up. Is. is mine up now? Seamless. Um, Great. Thank you. Yes. Well done. Oh, look. <laughs> oh, look. Thank you so much, Joe, for all of that information and particularly addressing 
some of the, the mental barriers and the challenges, as well as the really practical steps about things that we can do. Um, really appreciate all that info and really appreciate everyone who's come along tonight. Thank you very much. So I'm Ursula Hogburn from Zero Emissions Sydney North. We are a group of local volunteers who wanted to make it as easy as possible to really, uh, to really address some of the significant ways to reduce emissions. I'm just going to go through top five. And what I'm, um, what the slides are based on and what I can provide to Joe for everyone afterwards is we've actually done a guide of these solutions and links to local groups and local resources where possible. So I'll give the link to Joe and everyone can get their own copy of our full guide. I'm just going to go through the top five points on the guide tonight. So, like Joe said, what are we starting with here? In Mossman, a significant amount of our emissions are from electricity. Also, 71% of us want Australia to be a world leader on climate. And it's really um, inspiring and empowering to know there's actually some significant things we can do in our households, as well as the changes that government can help bring, as well as the changes that business can help bring. The Mossman Council has really led the way. They've set a net zero target of, for Mossman Council for 2040 for our community. And if we all do our bit, we actually can significantly achieve this. Um, as a baseline, an average household in Mossman is producing around 18 tonnes of greenhouse gas a year. And the top five things I'm about to go through will, almost, will more than halve that and will get you significantly closer to zero emissions. So what could you do? I'm going to go through the top five things from this diagram. And as I said, we'll provide you with the full version afterwards. So first of all, and this one's really exciting because once you've done it, it's kind of a set and forget solution, is actually moving our superannuation and our banking has a significant impact. So if just 7.7% .7 of Australians' total superannuation moved across to renewables, we'd be funding Australia being 100% renewable energy by 2030, which is incredible. Um, our, everyone's personal superannuation balance is different, but the average balance, if it's moved from fossil fuel supporting to renewable energy supporting, we're looking at saving around 12 tonnes of carbon dioxide a year, which is the equivalent of planting about a, nearly 180 trees, which is just fantastic for a pretty simple solution. Obviously, get your own financial advice, see what's most relevant to you, but many people are finding that the ethical and renewable energy funds are providing really great returns as well. And the Market Forces website and our website that I've linked have got lots of information on that. Uh, second, and this one alone nearly halves your household emissions, is switch to a renewable power company. Uh, their Greenpeace commissioned a green electricity guide uh, a few couple of years ago. Power Shop and Diamond Energy were both five star rated for providing renewable energy. And they're doing solar, wind, um, and other sources of renewable energy. But once again, you know, have a look, see what suits you. But the feeling of knowing every time you switch your PowerPoint on, you're, you're technically, um, your house is being powered by renewable energy, whether or not you can get rooftop solar. And every time you're paying your electricity bill, you're funding new solar, new wind. Um, it really is a fantastic feeling and a significant way to reduce emissions. Third, if you can, um, install rooftop solar. And you'll see here, you know, significant emissions reduction as well, because you're actually generating your own power rather than using power from the grid. Um, how much is solar these days? you can get a decent quality system for around $1,000 a kilowatt. So from you know, genuinely around $5,000, 
you can be getting a good size five kilowatt system. Um, so sometimes people think that solar is quite prohibitively expensive and are reasonably pleasantly surprised to find out that amount. Solar will also be paying back your investment within a few years. And from then on, you just get all the upside of lower power bills. And once again, some significant free planning impact there, depending on the size of your system, maybe the equivalent of anything from about 80 to 160 trees planted a year, which is great. Um, our fourth tip um, is switching to a reverse cycle air conditioner, or if you've already got one in your home, using it for your heating and cooling as much as possible. Like Joe and Luani have mentioned, we need to be getting off gas for our heating and reverse cycle air conditioning is the way to go. Um, you'll be lowering your power bill by nearly 50%. And if you've got solar and you're using solar for your air conditioning, then that's a complete win-win. Um, and our last tip um, we love because it saves money as well as being incredibly simple um, is simply reducing your hot water use by a third. Hot water is one of our major sources of energy use and therefore emissions. And simply things like shorter showers and washing our clothes in cold water significantly reduces our power bills and our emissions. And even something as simple as reducing our hot water can be the equivalent of several tonnes of CO2 a year and around 45 trees planted a year. Now our full guide has 15 tips and they're all ranked in order of CO2 reductions. So you can really make some informed decisions about what you're gonna do and why. Um, as I said, we will provide that to Joe to provide to everyone. And then if you're feeling like a bit of inspiration, our guide's also got three case studies, all locals, what are they doing? Um, we look at you know, Alex, who's in an apartment locally, some of his solutions include vegetarian diet, very rarely buying anything new. He particularly likes upcycling furniture. Um, he's composting. He's using public transport. Clayton Paul and their children, they have a very large solar system. They actually audited their house first to reduce their energy use and did things like adding insulation and ceiling fans as well. So they did a lot to reduce their consumption as well as getting solar. And then Chris and Jill, um, who actually are some of the early founding members of the Mossman Community Gardeners, uh, which is free and welcomed everyone. Um, you know, some of their solutions include um, the gardening, they're growing locally, um, LED lights, and using their bikes rather than a car as much as possible. And it's just a whole range of local solutions, some being very low cost, some being easy, um, some being more of an investment, depending on what suits you. Oh. And last of all, if you'd like to stay in touch, we're on Facebook, um, we're on Twitter, Instagram, um, so, and we also have a website packed full of ideas. So um, jump on the website and feel free to uh, download any of our materials. We hope they're really helpful. You're wonderful, Ashla. Thank you. And thanks to all the members of Zero Emissions Sydney North um, and the support that I know you get from Mossman Council as well. Um, not every community has this, so you're pretty lucky, um, Mossman. Um, and I know I've certainly used you to help me in my own personal journey as well. So, um, yeah, thanks for making it easy for us. Um, and now it's my great pleasure. I've got a fly flowing around now. Um, and um, I'm going to share my screen again, um, hopefully with great success and introduce you um, to another Mossman Council superstar, um, which is, and I, I believe, are you a doctor, Ruth? Do I got your official title? Yes. Dr. Ruth Irwin. Thank you. Thanks so much for- Professor, um, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, I've just downgraded you. Oh, my apologies. Professor. Oh, Ruth don't Ellen. you worry. It's fine. <laughs> and uh, you've got, I know we're anyway. kind of on the end of, uh, haven't given you a lot of time. So um, I'm going to give you five minutes yeah. if that's okay to talk about all the amazing things Mossman Council are doing. 
I don't want to take up everyone's time too much. I know we're sort of running a bit over, so I'm going to be pretty brief. But thank you, Joe, and thank you, Ursula. You've just done an amazing job. I'm just really impressed. It's fantastic. Um, and really all I wanted to do was say head over to the Mossman Council website. It's a, the website's been redesigned. So if you look on the top bar, you'll see environment along the top. And if you push on that, you'll get, you can come down to sustainable living. And in the sustainable living file, there's loads of really wonderful resources. So we um, commissioned somebody to make some beautiful little, uh, very short uh, videos on how to reduce emissions in your home. Um, and each one has each one of these videos, there's about 10 of them, have got different ideas. Um, there are a slideshow on what you need to do in order to put solar on the roof. So it's a step-by-step -step guide and it's got a whole lot of links to things like the um, Australian Climate Council, um, which can tell you really safe people to have, use for providers. Uh, so it's a, a really good way to start off if you're thinking about putting solar on the roof. Um, obviously, Mossman has set out a mitigation plan. And that mitigation plan is partly about council and council operations, but a lot of it is also about the community and about community engagement. So you can have a look at that too. Um, and I think Ursula and Joe mentioned that we have a target that we need you all to jump forward and help us to meet, which is to reduce um, emissions in Mossman to net zero by 2040. That's 20 years. It's not really very long, um, considering that we are one of the greatest our area is our LGA is one of the highest emitters in Sydney, and Sydney is one of the highest emitters in the world. So we have a lot of um, easy, low-hanging fruit, as Joe was just pointing out. It's actually going to be really quite simple for us to reduce emissions quite radically, um, but we do need to take those steps, those simple but very effective steps, as soon as we can. And you probably saw that very recently the IPCC came out with a new report um, just a couple of weeks ago. The news is not good. We basically have 10 years to really sort this out. And what they're advising is, is that the faster we can reduce emissions, the better. So the more we can do this year, the more impact we have over the following decades. And uh, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get everybody to really come on board as quickly as possible. And if you have any wonderful ideas about how you can reach out further into the community, please get in touch with us. We would love to support you while you're doing that um, and because we need to make sure that we reach people who don't normally come to things like this, events like this. Because as Joe was saying, this needs to become normal. So the more we can do of these kinds of things, the more that um, we can make visible on our own households and the more we can have conversations with our neighbours that this is a normal sort of process, uh, the, the quicker these kinds of changes are going to take place. So, yep, I just wanted to point you in the direction of the website. Um, just put it in the link there to Ruth. So, um, that's and great. The, that's the great. website looks Enjoy. fantastic. Well done. <laughs> I yeah, know how yeah, hard we've been working quite information. hard on that. Yeah. It's yeah. not easy. There's a lot to cover on oh, a council yeah. website. So well done. Um, well, look, yeah, thank great. you all. And I Have, guess the only other thing questions I wanted to say is that, um, yeah. oh, sorry, one last thing. And that is that um, uh, along with Ursula's group, uh, we are doing another Zoom on solar installation on your house on the 16th of November at 6.30. So watch out for that link. And yes, Fantastic. if you have any questions, far away. I can I can send that out. Um, or if, if it's up, I can send it out at this part. Otherwise, yeah, keep an eye out through Council's website. There's no shortage of opportunities. If you're feeling like you don't know what to do, then head over to Council's website, head over to Zero Emission Sydney North. You'll get a recording of this. Share it with five of your favourite people or if you didn't particularly enjoy it, five people you don't like very much. But um. I am very grateful that Mossman Council um, have invested in this and they're really passionate about making a change in the community. So um, thank you uh, to all of you for spending your evening. It must be dinner time. Um, 
if you haven't already had it, or if not, cup of tea or wine or whatever it is we do at this point in time. Um, so thank you for um, being part of this evening, everyone. Um, you can also follow the conversation along um, at Good for the Hood. We have various free things for the community at different points as well. Um, but yeah, it's been my pleasure to join you this evening and um, let's get reducing. It's time. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, really thanks everyone. Pleasure. And thank you everyone for attending. Good night all. Good night. Good night. Thank you.